frazzled this week, which is good because I realize I'm not as strong as sometimes I may think, and I'm definitely dependent upon the Lord. And it seems like it happens this way when you get ready to go preach a revival or go on a mission trip. Anything and everything that can happen happens before you leave or when you come back or both. And so uh, that's the way it is, but our God is greater than all these things, and so I'm encouraged by that. This morning's message, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. In case you got lost along the way, just remind you it's not normally how I preach through a book, but we're just trying to take each section and see how it applies to the local church. I'm not getting every single thing out of every verse. I'm not trying to. I'm just making some applications to the local church. We're matching this together with Sunday school, and uh, hopefully at the end of the summer you'll have a greater love for the church and uh, greater love for the Lord, and so that's my goal or my desire in working through this. All right, 1 Thessalonians 3, beginning in verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. And what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. As we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound. Increase and abound in what? In love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may, be, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just ask that you will take this word and apply it to our hearts this day and that it will accomplish what you are sending it forth to do. Give our minds understanding. Give us soft and pliable hearts uh, that we'll have some fertile soil to work with. You'll plant this word within us. It will increase and grow and bear lasting fruit. So Lord, help us with these things this day. For we know that unless the Spirit of God opens our eyes, we'll not see the truth. Unless the Spirit of God opens our ears, we won't hear the truth. And unless the Spirit of God softens our heart, there will be no fertile soil that will produce good and lasting fruit. So we're dependent upon you for the reception of this message and the application thereof. So we pray these things this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at the church as a family unit, how they tie together. And we saw that Paul used this Greek word uh, for orphan. And uh, it was a word that shows the pain on both sides. The parents being having their child taken away and then also from the child having his parents removed. And this separation and this heartbreak of wanting to be back together. Something separated them that they had no control over. And so we looked at that last week and showing the family love that ought to exist in a local church that we actually have great desire to be together as a body of Christ. Well, now in this passage, what I, I kind of want to bring out about the local church is this sharing of a good report has great effect. When when things are good, said that are good, it actually will have an effect upon the world. We have enough bad news that spreads around about the local church. If I'm to go around Azel, or if I, a matter of fact, I could go any place in the world, I imagine, to any local coffee shop, and if you bring up the subject of religion, it doesn't take long for somebody to say something bad about the church, or bad about their pastor, or bad about the music leader. They'll find something negative to say about the church. It's just, it's kind of like it's just human nature, the depravity of the heart. And so we, we find that seemingly everywhere we go. But what would happen, what would happen to this church, and forget the generalization, but what would happen 
with First Baptist Church of Briar if we were all of a sudden filled with positive attitudes in joy in the things of God, joy in each other, and the, such a joy that you could not contain it and it just kind of came out wherever you went. That in your workplace, in your social gatherings, in your shoppings, and wherever it is that you do life, that the people you rub shoulders with, they couldn't be in a conversation with you over a couple of minutes, and the next thing you know, you're talking about your church, you're talking about the message you heard, you're talking about the truths of the theology that you're grabbing a hold of, or you're saying, man, it's a joy at our church, because right now, you know, our pastor's going down to Mexico, and he's working with our church plan, and, and the other week, we had 33 people in Syracuse, New York, and, and man, we're starting to build a church up there, and, and it just came out of you, some positive, joyful thing that were in your heart. What could happen to this place if that begins to spread through you into the community or into the areas in which we live? I just, I just want to remind you of your pastor. I still think it's a valid way to reach out into our community by being positive about the things of God, joyful about your relationship with God. I think it's just a little bit contagious. Amen? You, you can do that, or you can go out in the community and say, church is boring, I hate church, I only go there where I feel better about my conscience, and I really don't like anybody there. If you go with that attitude, I doubt very much that you're going to in, uh, spawn interest in the world to be a part of what's going on in the church. And so we can at least take the approach of having a joy-filled heart that just overflows out of us. And even if nobody's affected by it, you will get to live in the joy of the Lord. And so you'll benefit. And so I just want to encourage you to search your heart and see what type of attitude you're giving off to the world about your relationship with your church. Now, you can try it this way. I, I wrote a couple of sentences to try to specify it a little bit more clearly. But perhaps this will happen to you this week and perhaps you'll have this opportunity to respond. I ask this question, and I get this question, so maybe you do too. Somebody will say to you Monday morning at your job, how'd your weekend go? It's a typical question. How's the weather? Hot? Is it going to rain? Is there a hurricane coming? I wish a hurricane would come. How was your weekend? You know, those type of things. We get caught up in conversations. I'm just telling you that those type of questions is an opportunity for you to shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity for you to express joy. And you can respond in a way that gives great honor to your Lord, shows the joy of your heart, and it'll be an impact upon those who ask the question. I want to remind you, when a question is asked, you have the right to answer. But how you answer is going to have an effect. Stinking weekend, 108 degrees, air conditioner didn't work in my car, it's a bummer. It's a terrible weekend, just stunk. You can answer that way. You can have that kind of attitude. You can say that. Oh, this happened, that happened. My wife yelled at me. We went out and ate supper and they charged me, overcharged me and then they wouldn't take it off my bill. You can, you can respond that way and people do it all the time. You want negative responses? Come with me to shortstop in the morning and just go in there and start asking questions. You can get everything negative you can find because that's all they know. Or you can respond, how was your weekend? Oh, my weekend was wonderful. I grew in my faith. I learned to love my brothers in Christ more sincerely. My heart was full of joy to be at church hearing the word of God preached. It's a valid answer. You can say that. How was your weekend? Oh, man, it was wonderful. Man, worship together with God's people. We prayed together. We had a wonderful time doing this, and we did this. There was good fellowship. And, man, we're preparing this week to be able to make sure that a widow lady in our church gets food. We sent our pastor off to Mexico. It was a great weekend. And now the gospel's going to be going out this week. And, man, it was a joy. Hey, you ought to come to church with me sometime. You could respond that way. Or, or perhaps you could say this. You could say, uh, uh, um, oh, uh, and I done skipped it all together here. Okay, just scratch it. Say something like that. Is that good? That was my transitional sentence. It all just kind of went together. Say something positive. <laughs> say something that would be encouraging. I, I guess what I'm saying is say something like you actually love God and love His church. That testimony then spreads. They say, Man, every time I talk to them, they're always saying something positive about what they learned at church. I wonder what goes on up there. 
You know, back three, four, five years ago, all I heard was negative stuff. Now they're saying something positive. I wonder what in the world's going on around there. I just want to remind you, we have a great God. I'm absolutely confident of that. There is not a problem with God in this scenario. No problem. There's no problem with the gospel. The gospel's not deficient in any way. So the gospel's perfect. I want to tell you, you have a perfect, beautiful Savior who died on the cross and rose from the dead. And if we repent and believe in him, we can live for everlasting life. All of those things are true. And so we must look to us. How are we responding to this great God in our worship and in the world in which we live? All right. The local church's report, beginning in verse 6. The local church's report. Paul has sent Timothy, and now Timothy has come back to Paul and Silas, and he's giving the, his report of what he's found. And I believe it is critically important to see what he found, and we could also entertain the idea of all the things he does not mention. There's a lot of things that he does not mention. I think since it's such an encouraging report and since they're so report that the things he mentions are the most important things that could happen in the life of a church. And so his report comes back and here's the report. He brings good news. This is the same word for the, the preaching of the gospel. It is a good report of what is going on. And here's the good news. Number one, and he says it a couple of times in this passage, he is greatly encouraged because this little local church of Thessalonica has faith. Praise the Lord. I mean, can we not be excited that there's a group of hell-bound, idolatrous, worshiping people in Thessalonica. They have repented from the idolatry. They have turned their attention to worship the living God. They're being afflicted and persecuted and ridiculed for their faith, and they're still holding to their faith. Praise the Lord. Man, I was wondering if they were going to make it. I was wondering if it was real. If there's a pessimist in the room, it is I. And I just didn't know if they were genuine or if, <laughs> I'm being facetious here, but when they asked Jesus in their heart, did they mean it with their whole heart? I, I just want to know if it was real. Were they really trying? I'm just like, is their faith real? Well, their faith is real. Because the fire came, the heat was increased, the afflictions come, and Timothy went and talked to them, and their faith is still valid. And in the midst of all of the difficulties, they are still believing God. What about you? What saith you? Our church in 12 years has gone through this, 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 and this. We won't go through all the stories and all the ups and downs and all the roller coasters. But after all of the things I've personally witnessed in 12 years, and many of you have witnessed them with me, do you still? faith Christ do you still believe him do you still believe the church is going to be built do you still believe Jesus is going to return do you still believe that God is God amen if you got faith I'm excited out of all the things that have happened if you still believe the tangible realities of the things that matter in the word of God praise be to the Lord the second thing that he brings back what love not only did they have faith, but they still loved one another. You want to find a people that can divide and cause a bunch of riffraff within a church, you will find a people that do not love one another. You turn up the heat, you give some tension in the room, and then you find out who loves and who does not love. Everybody gets along. You see people fall in love or something like this when they're younger and they get one little problem comes along and then they hate each other and won't talk to each other anymore. Well, that was never love to start with. But when you find a people that truly love, affliction, persecution, and difficulty comes upon them and they just draw closer together. That's love. They don't, they don't flee away from each other. They just draw closer to one another. That's what is happening in Thessalonica. Timothy comes back. Paul, you're not going to believe this. Not only do they believe the things you preach, not only do they still believe in Christ, but in all the hardships they've been through, 
They don't even have a building that they can worship in. They don't even have a pastor because they haven't have a pastor of this church yet. And they're under some very, very difficult circumstances being separated from their families. Some of the women in this church, their husbands are still believing in this Jewish law and, and holding to the legal system of Moses. And it's all a big mess. But those people of the local church are just binding together all the more strongly. Paul's like, wow. That is above and beyond anything I could ask for. They still love one another. And he says, remembrance. Not only do they have faith and love, but look what the church does. They always remember us kindly. So I want you to see both aspects. Faith and love in the church, but the local church still has remembrance for Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and they love and appreciate Paul, Silas, and Timothy because they're the ones who brought the gospel to them. So the local body loves the leadership, and the leadership loves the local body, and when you put those two scenarios together, they long to be with one another in order that they can worship the living God and have an impact upon the world. That's what's going on here. Faith, love, and remembrance. And now look at this word. I want to spend just a little bit more time with this one word. But after it says, remember us kindly, notice what they do. And long to see us as we long to see you. Same Greek word in both phrases. So you have a local body longing to see the leaders and you have leaders longing to see the body. Okay, so same word on both accounts. This word, yeah, I'll skip the pronunciation. To have a strong desire for something with the implication of, listen to this, with the implication of need. Need, long for, or desire. The local church needed Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Paul, Silas, and Timothy needed the local church. May I submit to you that God works through the local church and he establishes the local church as his institution upon the face of the earth. He gives the local church leaders. He gives the local church a gathering and these two come together for the glory of God, for the edification of the people and for the impact of the world. So what's going on here. There's a longing desire. You, it's, I don't think it's in the sense of human relations but just for your mental capacity uh, it's be like this if me and my wife were separated because I went on a mission trip to Russia or, or to London England or something like that and so I'm way over there and I can't get back you know there's I'm prevented and I can't come and she can't come the other way well I would be expressing I long to see my wife I long to be with her and she would be over here in America saying I long to see my husband many military people experience this all the time they long to be with their spouse and it's just a, a, a burden upon their heart that is what he's communicating this is the reality of how church really should be there's that type of burden for us to be together for the worship of the living God this is the way God designed it and when we are not a part of it I just want you to understand you're missing it we're missing out God's church is that important that we have that type of longing there's tons of texts where this verse is used, but let me give you a couple because I, I want you to understand that he's really meaning a longing to be together. Uh, one of my favorite passages, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, you don't have to look these up, I'm just going to quote them or read them real quickly off my sheet, but like newborn infants long for milk, crying, they all just scream till no end until you give them milk. That word longing for milk like a baby does, that's how Paul is longing for this church and this church is longing for him. They just cry out until they can be brought together. Paul's even going to pray, oh God, guide me to them. Or in Philippians, he says a similar thing, for God is my witness how I yearn, how I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. In that passage, he equates his desire to be with the Philippians with the same desire that Christ has love for us. And then uh, also in the sense of longing to go home. Anybody ever long to go home where there's a city whose builder and maker is God? 
I want to be there, I want to long. Paul said that. He says, for in this tent, I'm called the body a tent, in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. I just want to be present with the Lord. Or as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, I'm just pitching this moving tent one day's march near home. As much as I would long to be in heaven, I long to be with the church. As much as I long for us to be together would be equivalent for my yearning and desire to be in the presence of the living God for all of eternity. Paul says the same thing in Romans. For I long to see you. In Timothy, as I remember your tears, I long to see you. And, and notice when he says that to Timothy, he says, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy, I want to see you again, and if I see you, my heart will well up with joy. I got an email early this morning. My phone dinged. I looked at it. Jonathan Murdoch, we are so excited you're coming. We long to see y'all. Can't wait till you get here. There's something about a connection between believers in Christ when they come together in reality and truth. There is joy. It ought to be that way amongst the local body. Or even the Lord himself in James. He yearns, longs jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us. So as the Lord longs over the spirit in us, as we long for heaven, so Paul, Silas, and Timothy long to be together with the church of Thessalonica. By the way, it shows that Paul, Silas, and Timothy get it. They understand the importance of the local church and it tells us that the local church of Thessalonica gets it. The church is not a country club. It's not a social gathering. It's not just a hangout in order that I feel better about my spirituality or my supposed spirituality. The church is a body of people in a love relationship that ties together until the end. That's what the church is. That's what the church does. Now, that's the report. That's the report they receive. Now, what are the results of that report? So you get a report like this, there has to be a result to it. So what is the result? Verse 7 through 10. Look at them again. For this reason, because of the report, it's this reason, the report I have received by Timothy about the local church, for this reason, brothers, now notice Paul. He's prevented from coming. We don't know what all is going on, but we get a hint of it here. In all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Do you catch that? If I'm off somewhere out on a mission trip somewhere, and I'm out here and I don't know what's going on, I can tell you, if I can make contact back to you in this church, if I made contact with Tony or something next week, what am I going to want to know? There's only one thing that I want to know if I was to call him. Did everything go okay with Ben Mullen? How did Sunday school go? How did Wednesday go? What was going on with the people? Is there a good report? That's all I want to know. Because if I hear while I'm gone a good report, even if I am being persecuted street preaching in Mexico, my heart will be filled of joy to know that you're abounding in the things of God. And it ought to be true the other way. That if your pastor was gone and you hear that things are going well on the mission field, you ought to be filled with joy that things are going well there. That's the only thing that matters. It's all that matters is how you're living out your relationship with God. And if those things are right, then there's joy. Paul says that in the midst of his distress, in the midst of his affliction, specifically, we have been comforted. We have been comforted, parakaleo, to instill someone with courage or cheer, to comfort, to cheer up. Paul is cheered up because of the report. That's the result. He's heard this report and he's just filled with joy. If he got a report that said they lost the faith, they don't love each other, and they've apostatized, I think Paul just weep his eyes out. But to get a report like this, he's comforted, he's cheered up. I think this guy's ready to preach. He's full of joy now. Also, 
uh, we move on. He, he says that in all the distress and affliction, we've been comforted. We've been comforted about you through your faith. So there their faith is mentioned again. Verse 8. For now we live. We live. Paul brings out this word for life. Um, it is a, a word that in this context is used to signify being brought to full health. Paul is brought to full health because of the good report of the local church. You say, well, was Paul sick? I can put it this way. I can tell you when the church is not good, I'm sick. You say, what do you have? I don't know that there's a word for it, but I'm sick in my heart because if the church is not well, I just can't be happy because there's such a bond and a tie there. It'd be like if your kid was miserable, can mama be happy? Is mama singing around the kitchen? If the kid is just miserably depressed, it just don't work out well. But if the children are happy, everything's a good report, mom can be happy. It's the same situation in the church. Paul now has life because of the report. But watch this. He gives another reminder in verse 8. We live, we're full and fully healthy, if what? This is Paul's only concern. If you are standing fast in the Lord. Paul, man, this is a good report, but as long as you're standing fast in the Lord, I can live. But if you're not standing fast in the Lord, you want to rip the leader's heart out, you want to crush the leader's heart, then abandon the faith. Abandon the church and go do things your own way in the world. It just will kill the man who is leading the church. But if they're standing fast in the Lord, man, praise be to God can live if they are firmly committed in conviction or belief in the Lord. Thirdly, verse 9, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? So hearing this report, what does he want to do? He want, as Tony says, to be thankful. We want to, we want to give thanks to God for you. That's, that's what we want to do. And the reason we want to do so is for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Now, interesting, in the Greek, it's the same word. The joy that we joy for you. The joy that we joy for you. And so that sounds kind of awkward in English, so they say the joy that we feel. Or, let me give you a few translations. Joy with which we do joy. The joy we feel. The joy wherewith we joy. The joy with which we rejoice. I, I, he's just struggling to figure out how to put this phrase together in, in such a way that he's saying, we're so thankful for God for the report that we've heard. We receive joy and we want to be joyful about the joy we've received. Kind of a, a redundancy of words, but basically I've got a good report and it gave me joy. Now I want to take that joy and I want to just rejoice in my joy. Can I just break off and have a moment in joy? Man, it's just good. I'm just so happy about this, and I'm so happy about this. And just, You know, have you ever met one of those people, you just can't shut them up, they're happy about something, and they just won't be quiet? They're just joying in their joy. And you're like, man, stop it. I'm starting to feel bad. You're so happy. But could not a Christian church, could not a Christian pastor joy in their joy? Look, I assure you, there's enough death and negativity in my world to kill me. Could we not have a people that have been saved by the gospel that would be filled with joy and joy in their joy that it would be so apparent that the world would say, what in the world is wrong with you? And you could respond and say, there's nothing wrong with me. There's something right with me. If I've been redeemed from the wrath to come, I've been adopted into the family of God, I've been sealed with the Spirit of God, and I know that when I die, I'll be ushered into glory and spend eternity with my God, should not that produce joy somewhere in this heart? Should it not produce joy that brothers and sisters would come together and we would love one another, encourage one another, bless one another, pray for one another, and somehow that might just take our faces and lift them up just a little bit, that we'd have some sense of joy in the Lord. So he says that, and then he says in verse 10, there's continued results of these things. He's been comforted, he has life, he has joy. 
And so comfort, life, and joy produce what? Verse 10, as we pray, produces prayer. He prays most earnestly night and day. Another interesting phrase, but basically, let me try to help you to see what he says. Could we pray exceedingly and abundantly? As we pray exceedingly and abundantly. Or uh, a lexicon would translate it this way. As we pray quite beyond all measure. Behind, you can't even measure how much Paul, Silas, and Timothy are praying on the behalf of this local church because the good report has spawned in them prayer. Now, in case you missed that, usually in our local church, we pray when things go bad. We pray when someone goes to the hospital. We pray when there's a difficulty in the room, which is fine and right. Paul is praying because the report is good. They got a good report and over and above measure, you can't even measure how much he wants to pour out his heart to God in prayer in thanksgiving for the church. I'm telling you, you can have revival with this stuff. When you have a leader that is abundant in thanksgiving, praying to God and thanking him exceedingly abundantly for what he's doing in the church and the church has faith and love for one another and rejoicing in the things of God, something might break off, somebody might get saved, the church might grow and churches may be planted all over the world. Could happen. Or you could just act like nothing's going on, stick your head in the dirt and wait till Jesus comes. Right? You can just kind of just depress yourself through life and maybe one day it'll get better in the by and by. I just think that there's some reality here that we ought to live these things out in the present. I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to have joy. I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to actually have life to the full. I think I can live these things out in the kingdom of God right now because the Spirit of God lives within me and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So why should I live in the depression of the world when I can live in the joy of God involved in the local church where love abounds for one another and we can rejoice together in the things of God? Well... What is he praying here as he prays earnestly, exceedingly, day and night? <laughs> he wants to see them face to face. He wants to be in their very presence. He wants to be with them. And notice what he wants to do. Although he's rejoiced in it, it's been mentioned twice, but this Christianity thing has no ending point here in this world. He, even though he's encouraged about their faith, even though they're growing in their faith, even though he got a good report, watch what he wants to do when he's in their presence. When I'm in your presence, I want to supply what's lacking in your faith. It's a good report, but there's always room for growth. Amen? Every one of us, you've been under biblical teaching for uh, uh, quite a lengthy time in your life. You've read the Bible. Many of you have read from cover to cover. Many of you have faith, great faith, medium faith, little faith, but you've got faith. And if I was away from you for 10 years and got the opportunity to come back, I'd want to give you something that could increase your faith. Why? Because that's what matters. Your faith and trust in the living God. Paul gets it. Maybe nobody else in the world today in contemporary church growth movements get it, but Paul gets it. This is the right position of the local church. By the way, I just pause and let me chase a short rabbit and we'll shoot him, okay? Chase a rabbit and shoot the rabbit. I'm not belittling what is done in the Southern Baptist Convention per se. Not, and I'm not against, I'm for, I've been Southern Baptist since I was born. I, I'm not talking about that. But... In church life, typically, all we ever rejoice in or able to rejoice in is how many people walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and get baptized. I'm all for people getting saved. I'm all for people getting baptized. That's why I preach on the streets or go and do mission work or plant churches. I'm all for that. But I think we have limited ourselves in all the things we should be rejoicing in. Yeah, I want to rejoice and all the angels in heaven are going to rejoice if a sinner comes to conversion. Praise be to God. But could we not rejoice that there's some people in this church walking a narrow road uphill both ways in the snow with the wind blowing in their face and they still believe Christ? Could we rejoice in that? Could we rejoice that in all the division and separations that a church has experienced over a hundred years, there's still people that love one another in the church? Can we rejoice over that? Can we give thanks to God? Can we have joy in our heart about these things? 
So I'd rejoice about all of those things, not just narrow it down to one subject. But by the way, if I say that in the religious world, and I rejoice in your faith, and I rejoice in your love, I rejoice in the things that you're doing for God, they'll say, oh, so you're not having any baptisms. I'm not making this stuff up. That's what they'd say. Oh, so nothing's going on out there. You don't get it. You don't get it. I want a group of people that have committed them lives, their lives to the living God and will do so until the very end. That's Christianity. And that will affect those around you. But maybe even more importantly, it affects you. It affects your spouse. It affects your children. It affects your grandchildren. And these things are to be commended. Thirdly and lastly, verses 11 through 13. Now, we have seen the report. We've seen the results of the report. Now, you see in this last section a continual desire for the local church. A continual desire for the local church. Verse 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. This is his continual desire to lead or to be directed to be a part of the local church. I hear people that are isolated from the local church. Oh, me and God got our own thing going on. I can worship God in my dear blind. I read my Bible and stuff. I don't need the church. It's amazing that they're more spiritual than the Apostle Paul. God, my prayer is that I've been prevented. Maybe he's in prison. Maybe he's confined some way. Transportation has been blocked. Look, God, all my prayer is is that you'd get me back to the church. I want to be with my people. I want to see them face to face. I want to pray with them. I want to hug them. I want to embrace them. I want to teach them. I want to uh, give them what's lacking in their faith. That's all I want, God. Paul doesn't say, Lord, thank you for saving me from those people where I can stay out here by myself. His desire is to be with them. He says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, he probably just turned one page or two. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, he says... May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. That word direct your hearts is the same word that he is using here in our text. Direct our way to you. Secondly, verse 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound. Make you increase and abound. Increase and overflow. The first word has to do with a superabounding. It's a cause of increase. It's what causes increase. The second word, abound, causing something to exist in abundance. I don't know why this passage has three of these, but three of these phrases were just don't work in English and it don't even really work for me in Greek, but it's trying to double up something. I want to abound and abound more. I want to abound and I want to overflow. I want my glass to be filled and a gallon of water around it. It just, it just keeps on coming out because it won't all fit in. That, that's, he's just trying to communicate that. I just want more and more of this. The things he wants the local church to abound and overflow in is what? Love. That's what he wants. Look at that. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love. For who? For who? For one another. There is something that is to happen in the local church in which that we actually truly legitimately sacrifice to ourselves for the betterment of the other person that is crucial to the local church. And not only is that to exist within the body of the church, but also that we would have a love for those outside. You see, you see that there in the text. A love for one another and for all. And for all. As I was caught in a situation, I think I mentioned it on Wednesday night, but I mentioned it again as someone, uh, how are you going, they asked me, how are you going to Mexico? Are you taking a church van? No, I'm taking my car. Oh, I wish you'd take the church van. Why do you want me to take a church van? Well, that way I've got some people around here I'd like for you to take back. So I have to respond, right? I said, man, that would be a good idea if I took the church van because I love the Spanish people and some of them could ride with me. We could have good fellowship together. And I so long to get to Mexico because there's people down there that are so kind to us and so generous to us. And man, we go out and eat together. And it's a great time. 
I, I love people here. I love my local church, but I love people there. I love people in Syracuse, New York. I love people all over the world. I love people in Germany. I love people in Uganda. I love people uh, scattered all across. Why? Because it's the heart of God. And that's what we're to abound in. There's some people I have a difficulty in loving. Anybody? Can I get a witness? Hey, some people are hard to love for me. I, you, you probably know a little bit about my character. I know this is weird and strange, but I do better at the bar and at the local coffee store than I do in religious circles. I have a hard time loving religious folk. Not, not meaning necessarily local church people, but people who are religious out there. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. It's hard for me, but I want to increase and abound in that. I want my love to be enlarged. Moving on. So that, verse 13, so that, here's the purpose. We love one another and for all, as we do for you, for this purpose. So that he, the he must be God the Father and our Lord Jesus, back from verse 11, so that he may establish your hearts. To establish. To cause to be inwardly firm or committed. Established. He wants our hearts to be firm, strengthened, or established. Let me give you a couple of verses. Luke 22, when Jesus was speaking to Peter, he says, Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen or establish your brothers. It's very important that our hearts be established. Also, <clears throat> Paul says we are established or strengthened. And how are we established or strengthened? According to Paul, it is through the preaching of Jesus Christ. He says in Romans 16, 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel at the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. How are your hearts going to be established? How are they going to be strengthened that you can have faith and love for one another and be everything God's called you to be? You will have to be under the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have to be under the preaching of the whole counsel of God. You'll have to have the word to have authority over your life in order for you to be established that you would be strong and resolved and be able to stand whatever affliction or persecution may come. And what is it that we are to be established in? What do we want our hearts established in? Look here at the end of the verse. To be established in blameless in holiness. Blameless or faultless. That is the standard that God has set. We want to be established in our hearts in holiness before the living God. This church has faith. This church has love. This church has remembrance. This church's report has brought comfort. This church's report has brought joy. This is a good church. But they still lack some things in their faith. And they still need direction to be holy. Some people have said to me before, Randall, your standards are too high. So we should lower the standards. The standards... The standards are to be preached from the Word of God and by the Spirit of God we are raised up to the standards that God has given us. That's the way that we grow. I, I tell you from a sports analogy, from bicycling, if I ride with a guy every day that averages 15 miles an hour, that's what I do. I ride with this guy every day and that's the standard. Well, you show up on race day and the average 22 miles an hour, you're toast just don't work. You have to stretch yourself. You have to increase your workout. You have to make your legs burn a little bit that you would be able to be at that speed. So we need something to cause us to stretch a bit where we can grow, where we can be stronger. So I don't want to bring the standard down and make it more palatable for humanity. I just want to preach the standard of the Word of God and trust that the Spirit of God will stretch us and that our faith will grow stronger. The church is not a country club, nor a moral rotary meeting, no more than it's a tavern for folks to talk and sit around drinking beer. The church is a gathering of a people 
who have been purchased by the blood of King Jesus. They gather together regularly for the purpose of growing, maturing, encouraging, and loving. It is God's church. Jesus is the head. The Holy Spirit is conforming us into the image of the Son for His glory and for our good. And I pray that we will not lower the standard of the church to make things of the things of God more palatable, but rather we will lovingly help each other to be what God has called us to be. We must remember that the Spirit of the living God will enable us to be what we have been called to be. Lastly, just to remind you of something else, the gospel. What's the gospel in this? Paul is breathing out threats about the church when his name was Saul. Breathing out threats, getting orders and papers to be able to find any of the way and lock them up. Stamp out this thing called Christianity. That's Paul's, Saul's heart, you remember. The Thessalonians, they're worshiping all these false deities. Aphrodite being the leading deity, they're worshiping the sexual goddess. So here's all these idolatry, idolatrous worshipers, and over here is Saul trying to stamp out genuine Christianity. These two, the only thing they have in common is they hate God. That's all they have in common. And then walking down that Damascus road, the Lord Jesus shows up and speaks to Saul. And you know this story. His name's changed to Paul. He's blinded for a while, goes in, the scales are removed, and he sees. And all of a sudden, he becomes a mighty preacher of the gospel. He believes because his heart's been changed, his eyes have been opened, and now he's going to devote himself to preaching the gospel. He shows up over here in Thessalonica, over here in Thessalonica with all this idolatry. He preaches that which happened to him according to the things of God. The light bulb comes on for them. They throw out Aphrodite out of the house, they grab a hold of Jesus Christ and they don't look back. The only thing that is tied Saul or Paul to the Thessalonians is their devoted passion for Christ. That's a local church. Why are we here? Why are we gathered? Because we love Jesus. Because Jesus took us out of our depravity. He gave us a new heart and a right spirit that we might follow him the rest of the days of our life. And whether we die or whether the Lord returns, we'll be gathered together with him and we will always be together with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let us pray.